Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on Forgotten Weapons. There's another video series going on right now, and will continue to go on for another couple of years that you really should check out if you haven't already. It's called The Great War, and it's uh, hosted by a fellow named Indy Nidell. What he does is every week he recounts the history of World War I as it happened a hundred years ago that week. So if you watch it regularly, you get a running update on the war every week. It's a fantastic way to keep track of this war that really was so complex that it's almost impossible to really to understand or to grasp in a single book or a single narrative. Being able to stretch it out through literally the same time frame that it originally took place in, it's a really cool idea and I really get a kick out of watching it myself. Now, I notice that these guys are headquartered in Europe and their access to live firearms is, well, not as, as easy as mine. So I thought it would be cool to do a video here on the heavy machine guns of the Great War. Something that can kind of supplement the great work that they're doing over at the Great War channel. So I have with me here today three of the main machine guns that were used during the First World War, specifically on the Western Front. We have a German MG08, Machining Gewehr 08. We have a French Hotchkiss model of 1914. And we have a British Vickers gun. Now, one of the great ironies of the First World War dark ironies, but ironies all the same, is that the majority of the machine guns used worldwide on both sides were invented all by the same man. So the man who invented this gun was Sir Hiram Maxim. He was an American, born here in the US, and he was truly an inventive and technical genius. He couldn't help but always be working on something, tinkering, inventing, you name it. He in fact made an early name for himself in the field of electronics, or, or rather electrical power generation. And he was so good at it that he actually was a legitimate competitor to Thomas Edison. So much so that Edison's financial backers wanted him out of the way. So they offered him this kind of very lucrative fake job. They wanted to pay him to go to Europe for 10 years and keep an eye on uh, European electrical developments. But under no circumstances was he to invent anything himself. They just wanted him out of the way so that he wouldn't compete with Edison. Well, the price they offered him was $20,000 a year, which was quite the princely sum in 1881 uh, when he accepted the offer. He trundled himself over to London, set up an office, and immediately got very bored. Uh, he was not the sort of guy who could just take a bunch of money and kick back and relax and, and live the easy life. He wanted to be doing something. So uh, he recounted later, this is an apocryphal story, but he met an American friend in 1882, just happened to run into him, and was complaining about this. And, and his friend said, hang your electricity and your chemistry. If you really want to make a pile of money, invent some device which will allow these Europeans to cut each other's throats with greater facility. So this comment by his friend really kind of sparked an idea with Maxim. And by 1886, he had developed his first functional prototype machine gun. It was a pretty big, ungainly affair. But you know what? It worked. And it worked remarkably well. Now the Germans were one of the very first early adopters of the Maxim gun, and ironically, the British were another very early adopter. Uh, the Kaiser was so ecstatic when he first saw the demonstrations of the Maxim gun that he actually purchased the first few for the German military out of his own pocket. Uh, they would go on to adopt various versions of the Maxim gun, ultimately culminating in the MG-08, the Maschinengewehr 1908. So as early as 1892, the Ludwig Lowe company in Germany had signed a production license agreement to manufacture Maxim guns uh, for the German military. And they went right on doing that. Now Ludwig Lowe eventually became DWM. And during the war, they manufactured thousands upon thousands of these MG08s. One of the elements that really distinguishes this German version of the gun from all others was its mount, this guy. This was called a sled mount. It was designed, it was, it's an interesting and effective design. Uh, the front legs can be adjusted up and down to elevate or depress the gun so that depending on how much cover you have in front of the gun, you can raise the gun up just above it. Uh, it has a number of storage compartments on the back here for spare bolts, cleaning equipment, spare barrel, everything you need to run the gun. You can run these front legs perfectly out horizontal and then two men can easily carry the gun on its mount. Uh, you can see there's a, a clamped bracket up here that attaches the gun to the mount. We have an elevation adjustment, which allows us to precisely elevate and depress the gun. There is also a traverse 
It's a fairly limited traverse, but in World War I tactics, the idea was to set up a, a number of these guns with interlocking fields of fire covering specific uh, important areas and utterly annihilate anyone who walked into those areas. So a wide field of traverse wasn't really a necessity the way these guns were being used. Now you'll also notice there's a big chunk of iron on top of this gun. The Germans developed a four-part uh, set of armor for the guns. Now this only has a single piece. This has the water jacket shield. It has a little hole here so that you can see your sights. There originally would have been a faceplate up here to protect the front of the water jacket. That faceplate was actually the most popular piece of the armor, followed by this water jacket cover. The other two pieces were a big armor plate that sat down below here to help protect the gunner, and then an even larger armor plate that went up above the top of the gun. Um, those were issued at the beginning of the war, but it was quickly discovered that they made, well, they were a decent piece of armor, they were an even better target for enemy artillery and sniper fire, and so those top plates disappeared pretty quickly. Um, in fact, what gunners would often do is take the top plate of armor, and they'd go set it up somewhere else on the trench where there wasn't anybody around, and let allied artillery gunners lose their shells over there and leave the actual machine gun emplacement untouched. So in broad strokes, what is a Maxim or Vickers gun? Well, the idea was to develop a firearm that could fire functionally as long as it had ammunition supplied, potentially indefinitely. Now there are a number of obstacles that one has to overcome in order to meet that technical goal. The first is to have a, an action that is reliable, that as long as you present it with ammunition, it will fire it and eject the empty case. That's something that Maxim did fantastically well. The Vickers gun in particular, and the Maxim guns in general, are generally regarded as some of the most reliable machine guns ever developed, even to this day. Now, part of the reason they were able to do that is because they were quite heavy. A Vickers gun here, with its tripod and with its water, which we'll get to in a moment, weighs about 100 pounds. The, Mac the MG-08 that the Germans used is even heavier. It's a larger gun, it has more accessories built onto the tripod, and a heavier, or not the tripod, but the sled. And it's a heavier sled in general. That MG-08, with all of its accessories ready to go, that's 152 pounds. So with all that weight, it was possible to make very durable components. Now the second problem, or potential obstacle in this technical challenge, is you have to be able to feed the gun a lot of ammunition quickly. What Maxim came up with was the belt feed. So he would use a cloth belt, which has individual pockets for each cartridge. Typical belt length was 250 rounds. Um, this is not quite uh, 27 feet long, but I have heard people suggest that this belt is potentially the source of the English slang, the whole nine yards, as in, give them the whole nine yards of ammunition. At any rate, a 250 round belt would last somewhere around 30 seconds of continuous firing. And it was fairly easy to load a new one. You take the end tab, slide it through the gun, lock the first cartridge in place, rack the charging handle, and you're ready to go. So that's how Maxim conquered that obstacle. The next obstacle is if you're firing continuously, and these guns ran at 450 to 500 rounds per minute, well, you're going to overheat the gun. The barrel's going to get really hot, it may explode, it, it's not going to go well. You have to have some way to cool the gun. And Maxim's method for cooling the gun was to encase the barrel in this big jacket, which would then be full of water. We have a little plug here, you can open it up, pour water in. That water prevents the gun barrel from getting any hotter than the boiling point of water. So as long as you can keep refilling this jacket, keep it full of water, the gun stays cool enough to fire. Between the belted ammunition and the water cooling jacket, these guns quite literally could fire indefinitely. There was some testing done on, on a Vickers gun. Um, when these were finally put out of service by the British in the 1960s, where a gun was actually fired for almost seven days and nights continuously. And it worked the whole time, and it was still functional at the end of that test. As long as you keep the water and keep the ammunition coming, these guns will not stop firing. And that's part of what made their use in the First World War so incredibly bloody, is that the guns simply worked. So the French had tested the Maxim in the 1890s. In fact, virtually everybody in the world had tested the Maxim gun around that time. 
and they were fantastic guns. They were adopted by almost everybody. Obviously, the British Empire, the German Empire, uh, both made the Maxim their standard machine gun. Uh, they were very popular in the Balkans. Uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, all had standardized on the Maxim gun. Italy had bought a number of Maxims, although they would go on to use their own uh, Fiat Ravelli version, or Fiat Ravelli machine gun during the war instead. Uh, the Russian military standardized on the Maxim gun. China standardized the Maxim gun, although that wouldn't come until uh, nearly the beginning of World War II. The guns were extremely popular worldwide. Um, and France, frankly, was one of the few major powers that decided not to use the Maxim. Instead, they chose this design, the Hotchkiss. This is a model of 1914 Hotchkiss. Uh, dates originally back to, the 18, to 1897. Now what's kind of, again, darkly ironic is that this gun was originally invented by an Austrian military officer, Captain Baron Adolf von Odkolek. Now uh, Captain Baron Adolf had gone around looking for potential buyers for his design, didn't find any until he got to the Hotchkiss company in France. Uh, Benjamin Hotchkiss, the American founder of the company, was long dead at this point, but the, the company was being run by a couple of very capable designers. And they looked at his patent and they thought, there are some pretty serious flaws with it, but we see potential. And so rather than put it into production on a royalty basis, they bought this patent outright from him. They then went about making a bunch of modifications to it. And what they ended up with was a gun which is air-cooled, has a long gas piston running underneath the barrel, and it's fed by a metallic strip. So in several fundamental ways, this is different from the Maxim gun. The first and most obvious one is out here, cooling the gun. There are problems with water. Let's just put it that way. You have to carry the water. You have to be refilling the water jackets as the guns are firing uh, every so often. You also have the problem of what if a piece of shrapnel hits the water jacket? That's why we have this armor on the German MG08, and it was a very real thing. Armies issued patching kits because if, if something punctured that water jacket and the water drained out, well, the barrel inside there is very thin, and without the water, it can't fire for very long before it overheats to the point of not being usable. So the French decided that they could avoid all of those problems by going with an air-cooled gun. And in order to make this gun, to, in order to give it the, the sustained fire capability of a water-cooled, they made the barrel very, very thick and heavy so that it can take a lot of heat a lot of thermal energy before the temperature of the barrel goes up. Now they also added these five very distinctive donut rings. These are all solid metal and they're simply there to increase the mass and the surface area of the barrel to increase cooling capacity. Now this still wasn't quite as durable for sustained fire as the Maxim in its variants. Uh, official French policy was that for every thousand rounds fired continuously, you then had to spend four and a half minutes letting the gun cool and sponging down the barrel with water. So it's not perfect, but it does legitimately avoid some of the potential problems of a water jacket. The other practical real world difference between the Hotchkiss and the Maxim guns was its, its feed mechanism. Now we've got these belts that were used by the Maxim guns of all variants. Hotchkiss instead fed these guns with 30 round metallic strips. They had some pros and some cons. The downside is, of course, this gun had 30 rounds capacity compared to 250 or potentially even more for the Maxims. So every 30 rounds, the assistant gunner would have to reload the gun. The advantage was that the metal feed strips didn't have some of the potential problems of belts. It was discovered very quickly that you have to keep machine gun belts dry. If they get wet, the cloth belts tend to shrink and tighten and they would often tighten enough that the action of the machine gun was insufficient to pull cartridges out. That's a problem. Uh, and so a lot of work had to go into making sure that these belts stayed dry and usable in these horrific conditions of war. The metal feed strips of the Hotchkiss, on the other hand, were impervious to a lot of these things. They simply, they, they wouldn't shrink, the tension on the cartridges was always the same, and that made for a, a simpler operating mechanism. Unfortunately, they also bent. You can't, you know, bending a cloth belt, it doesn't matter, it just, it's flexible. The metal strips were not, and it was possible to bend them, and then you'd have to kind of bend them back into shape and fix them. So there were very reasonable pros and cons to both of these systems, and ultimately the French decided on an air-cooled, strip-fed gun. The British and the Germans decided to go with water-cooled, belt-fed guns. If you were on the receiving end of these guns, you probably wouldn't tell much of a difference. Um,
One of the areas that's not really all that well appreciated is that these machine guns didn't simply appear at the beginning of the First World War. These guns were produced and in widespread use in the 1890s, so 20 full years before the outbreak of World War I. And there is a question of what did they do? Why, why did people go into World War I not understanding and appreciating the horrific deadliness of these guns? when they'd existed for 20 years. And, and there are some interesting reasons for that. First off, these guns were primarily used effectively in colonial areas. So these guns were not seen as really representing the true, proper, gentlemanly fighting spirit of how European armies should act. The Continental Armies, and this is particularly evident with the French approach to war at the beginning of the Great War, was much more glamorous and glorified. It wasn't supposed to be one guy behind a machine gun simply mowing down the enemy. That's, that's not what war was supposed to be. So in Great Britain in particular, it was colonial commanders who first truly developed an understanding of how to effectively use the early Maxim guns. They were in a position where they had l very limited manpower, they had limited resources, and they were fighting vastly outnumbered all the time. And they, they were able to take these machine guns and, and first really understand how to use them against large numbers of attacking enemy. Unfortunately for the British, these commanders weren't really all that influential back home. And when they would come home talking of, of the phenomenal firepower and potential effectiveness of the Maxim guns, they weren't really paid any attention. Now, we also have the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 05. This was really the first truly mechanized war where machine guns like the early Maxims and the early Hotchkiss guns were put into use. We actually see entrenched positions defended by machine gun emplacements and they were just as effective then as they would prove to be in World War I. Now there were military observers from all the great European states in this conflict sending back reports, and they too didn't really get the recognition that they probably should have. Now the German army took these a little more seriously. Uh, at the beginning of the war, the German army had the most machine guns and was kind of at the, the leading edge as far as there was such a thing in mainland Europe. Uh, but it would take the course of the war for all of the major powers to, to vastly multiply the number of machine guns that they had on hand. No one truly appreciated the effectiveness of these guns, despite having ample opportunity to have seen them. No one really understood it until the war truly got started. So rather than try to just explain this lack of understanding of the machine gun, I think I can get the point across better by relaying some of the words of uh, a non-com in the British Army named Edward Spears, who was in the 11th Hussars, a, a very fine and glorious, glamorous cavalry unit in the British Army. They'd been in, in, in the charge of the Light Brigade, and that was the sort of history that this unit had. Well, uh, Spears was put in command of the machine gun section, and he was quite the, the fan of the machine gun probably naively so at the time. Um, he says, on this occasion, the whole brigade was carrying out mounted mass formation maneuvers under the brigadier in the Long Valley, and I was in charge of the brigade machine guns, with the object, I suppose, of getting rid of me and my tiresome contraptions, which were not ornamental and were apt to get in the way. I was told to ride off and see if I could put them to some intelligent use. And Spears' idea of an intelligent use was quite different from his battalion commanders. Full of enthusiasm and finding a mound, a hill, with a beautiful view of the brigade moving about in a solid mass of horsemen less than a thousand yards away, I crept up and mounted my machine guns there. He goes on to talk about how he set up some lines of retreat in case anyone happened to, you know, a cavalry troop decided to charge at them to try and eliminate them. But no one did through this whole exercise. He fired a, a, a few rounds of blanks just to uh, get people's attention and got no attention. So. Nothing of the sort happened. No one paid the least attention to us. So for 10 minutes, I fired away at the nominal rate of 600 rounds per minute per gun. Then, concluding that every one of the 2,000 men of the brigade would have been killed at least twice over, and it would be a pure waste of ammunition to go on firing, I stopped. Exhilarated at this holocaust, which perforce included most of my friends, I cantered up to the bri brigade commander, who he describes as uh, a dark and hard-looking sort, very stoic British Army old guard sort of commander, uh, who would apparently later serve with distinction in the Great War. 
Uh, anyway, Spears comes up and says to him very happily, uh, you are all dead, sir. Telling him that his command has all been annihilated. The commander instead glowered at him. Expecting in my innocence some congratulations, I realized from this expression that something had gone wrong. The gallopers sitting in their horses about the commander looked blank. Then the general spoke at last. Never, he said, never have I seen a lack of cavalry spirit more blatantly displayed. Turning to those about him, he rasped out, quote, Here is a young cavalry officer who has the impertinence to say that the infantry weapons he is so inappropriately carting about has wiped out the 1st Cavalry Brigade, the finest mounted force in Europe. Get off your horse, sir, he barked at me, and handed over and walked back to the barracks, the proper form of locomotion for you. That pretty well describes the general European attitude towards machine guns. Heavy machine guns like these three really show us the essence of World War I in microcosm, I think. Um, they are truly the, the convergence of the industrial capacity to mass manufacture tens of thousands of machine guns like this, as well as the vast quantities of ammunition that were fired through them, the, the truly inhuman scale of killing that these guns became capable of, you know, there were, there were elements, there were areas these guns were used prior to World War I, but people failed to really understand whatever, what, what capacity they truly had. So I hope that going forward as you watch uh, Indy on the Great War and, uh, and follow the progress of the war, I hope this video helps put some perspective on the machine guns that you will continue to hear about, that will continue to wreak havoc on the uh, combatants in the First World War through the end of 1918. Now, if you enjoyed the video, of course, tune back in to Forgotten Weapons. We'll be taking a look at some of these in a little bit more detail. I would like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for providing me with access to all three of these guns. They are actually all for sale here in the United States. If you would like to uh, have, well, an artifact of the First World War, a fully functional artifact of the First World War in your own collection, um, I do have some links in the text below. You can check out the auction pages for these three guns. and. Uh, bid on them yourself if you're here in the U.S. and would like to own them. So, thanks for watching and tune back in again to Forgotten Weapons.